rainfall up in broad areas over districts, right down to um, specific rainfall quantities in catchments and in valleys. Um, but not only that, doing something what we call ensemble modelling as well. Running the same model over the same area, uh, maybe 50 or 100 times, with slightly different inputs, just to see how much variability there is in the atmosphere, uh, or the inputs that then uh, result in different rainfall quantities. So also that gives us a um, really useful information when we talk about conflicts. I mean, most of the forecasts you see in here through the media are really in the black and white. But underlying that, there is a, usually a whole range of uncertainty. And uh, sometimes the forecast can be very uncertain, and sometimes highly certain. So being able to communicate that using uh, the information coming out of this new super computer will be a, yet another game changer. So just a little bit about that super computer. Um, you can see on the uh, on the board here. The very, uh, if you if you're into numbers and things, teraflops. Okay, we've moved on from kilobytes and megabytes and gigabytes. We're now talking about teraflops now. Um, but in, in broad terms, the Bureau runs a supercomputer at the moment, and the new one will be 16 times faster. And when that gets upgraded again in a couple of years' time, it will be uh, as much as 50 times faster. So. It uh, has got the capability to be upgraded. You can see on the, on the right hand side there, a number of the benefits of this will be uh, obviously more accurate forecasts. And we've been moving down this path for some years now in terms of uh, the Bureau's forecast. Obviously the, the weather's a chaotic beast, so there's, it's always going to be going to throw us, show us, uh, throw us uh, sort of um, uh, spin balls here and there. Um, but overall, the forecasting capability of the Bureau is improving largely because of supercomputer power. Our, um, our, also, our understanding of the weather is improving through research, but it it's really hinges on this supercomputing power to be able to get more accurate and more dynamic and more localised weather forecasting. Um, okay, I want to talk briefly, this is the only slide I really have on, on fire. Um, but there's been a huge uh, change in the way we understand fire, and it's, this has taken place, uh, it's two-pronged really, not only uh, seeing the sort of fire behaviour we're getting, but being able to collect that data and the researchers being able to analyse it, and using supercomputers that model the atmosphere at high resolution, we're able to understand some of the, the physical and dynamical properties that uh, give rise to sometimes what we call unexpected fire behaviour. But we're now, we're now moving from what we would previously have called unexpected fire behaviour to becoming more predictable fire behaviour. And this is an excellent example that took place in the Grampians this year, where leading up to this event there was fire in the landscape. Um, the day before, the, uh, the fire really took off and what we call become a plume-dominated fire. The fire behaviour analysts were ahead of the game. They knew that this was a high probability of occurring. So every strategic and, 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 and tactical decision was based on the fact that the fire behaviour ultimately was going to look like what you see on the screen there, which means very different tactical operations on the ground than uh, any nor a sort of a more normal behaved fire that might be more wind-driven or terrain-driven. Um, so there's been a lot of research done and, and we're sw really switched on now uh, to the situations where this can occur and the incident control centres have got some excellent resources, some excellent information uh, at their fingertips now to uh, highlight the possibility of this occurring rather than being surprised, which is, was probably what used to be the case in the past. So just a, a bit of information there of what we call pyrocumulus, if you're not familiar with that term. Most fires don't develop their own clouds, but uh, when they do, uh, they become uh, highly um, dynamic and uh, that's then manif that man manifests itself on the ground as uh, quite uh, intense fire behaviour. And in the most extreme cases, these clouds can reach right up to the top of our tropopause. And it seems ironic, but a fire which um, is very intense at the surface can ultimately end up pr producing its own ice crystals uh, at the top of the atmosphere. Um, in the most uh, extreme uh, uh, instances. And uh, we use something now called the Continuous Haynes Index, a bit like the Fire Danger Index, it's meant to complement it. 
um, but gives us an idea of whether a fire can uh, end up generating this type of um, uh, fire behaviour. That's on the fire weather forecast and uh, a few uh, uh, available few, through a few other mechanisms as well. Um, talking a little bit about heavy rain leading to flood events, as a meteorologist we, we often look at uh, or use pattern recognition in combination with uh, information from our dynamic met, uh, weather models. But there are three patterns typically it boils down to that we're looking for that generate our most heaviest rain events. And we've come a long way since uh, uh, events like uh, Benella, which really surprised us in terms of the quantity of rainfall. Uh, it's pretty rare now for us to sort of be surprised that there will be a, a heavy rainfall at, at least. We might not get the quantities always right, but uh, predicting heavy rainfall events now are, are becoming um, uh, uh, much easier thanks to numerical weather modelling. But the one you see here is what we call the East Coast Low. If you were to look at a synoptic weather pattern 24 hours prior to that, you would have no idea that a low could deepen so quickly uh, on the eastern seaboard. And uh, now our numerical models can do that, uh, whereas previously they weren't able to capture that DAP, that uh, dynamic rapid deepening of these low pressure systems. So obviously this type of system, because it deepens so rapidly and because it has a, um, it is often influenced by enhanced moisture off the Tasman Sea, is responsible for heavy rainfall, particularly in Gippsland, um, but also can be responsible for heavy rainfall in Melbourne and also in the Otways. Interestingly, it's this type of event that has been responsible for um, Victoria's heavy, heaviest ever rainfall recorded. And uh, that was in the Otways uh, a number of decades ago, and it was due to an east coast low like this. Um, the second heaviest rainfall event occurred in Victoria, um, occurred at, uh, in Wilson's Promontory just a few years ago. Not quite this type of event, but very similar. And uh, both those rainfall, daily rainfall totals are, uh, were in excess of sort of 350 to 400 millimetres. Now, the other one uh, which some of you will be familiar with, this occurred a few years ago, back in 2011, the, the flooding across the Northern Plains. Um, but, uh, but also the, the sort of pattern that uh, uh, was responsible to some extent for the Benella floods back in 93, where we see a low pressure system it doesn't look all that low, it's only about a thousand hectopascals compared to the lows that we can get off the Southern Ocean and Tasman Sea. But the, the issue is it stays there for a long time. And it's helped by that high pressure system that you can see cradled, cradling that low to the south. If a low stays in one position for a long time over multiple days and it's linked to tropical moisture, it's, uh, it's just a, a very unique and uh, high probable outcome of getting uh, heavy rainfall over, uh, over a wide area and that's what happened back in 2003. So it's that low, slow moving low that doesn't move anywhere due to that uh, quite strong high moving southwards and it's linked to tropical moisture. Um, so it usually only occurs during the January sort of February time frame, sometimes into March. You can see there we've got a, a tropical cyclone off the northwest coast. And the last system uh, again, this is fairly recent, uh, only last year, where we had a uh, quite intense low near 980 hectopascals coming out of the Southern Ocean. Not linked to tropical moisture, but very, very, a very intense low. Um, low pressure systems are responsible for uh, air rising in the atmosphere, and you need air to rise to generate rainfall pretty much. And uh, the lower the pressure is, the, the greater that lifting mechanism is. And uh, although this was moving through quite quickly, uh, it's the, the rapid deepening of the low, the intensity of the low, uh, with moisture in the atmosphere that results in the, uh, in the heavy rain. So they're the three systems. Um, and as a meteorologist, when I communicate um, why do we often get you know, heavy rainfall um, out of the atmosphere, and it's these lows that act as the trigger. And if you think of the atmosphere like a sponge, Okay, a sponge can hold a lot of moisture, and our atmosphere can actually hold a lot of moisture. And you might not get any rain out of it, but there's a lot of moisture out there. You need something to trigger it, 
you need what we call a uh, something to squeeze that sponge, squeeze the moisture out of the atmosphere. And the low pressure systems are uh, one very strong mechanism that results in that squeezing process. So the, the rapid deepening of the lows, the intensities of the lows are what uh, res ultimately, response, it, uh, ultimately result in that squeezing of the moisture. And fortunately now with uh, our numerical models they give us a really good idea of how much moisture can be squeezed out of the atmosphere. Whereas up until probably a couple of decades ago, a lot of that process of working out how much rainfall was based on um, uh, experience and knowledge of past events. Uh, just very briefly, just got a few slides here about severe thunderstorms because they are a very difficult, uh, different beast compared to trying to forecast uh, heavy rainfall events or wind events. Um, when we're talking about severe thunderstorms, uh, we're talking about a, a, a few different phenomena associated with them. Obviously large hail, not like uh, the thunderstorms we get in, in winter, which obviously have usually quite small hail. It's the extra moisture in summer that generates the larger hail. Uh, the, uh, the wind gusts of 90 kilometres an hour or more, often uh, very quick, very rapid and short-lived. Um, heavy rainfall, usually quite localised uh, and uh, of a, an intensity over a short period of time that results in flash flooding. And uh, the last one that defines a severe thunderstorm is a tornado, obviously very difficult to forecast for usually because they're quite uh, short-lived and require very specific conditions under the thunderstorm for them to develop. So in terms of the life cycle of a, a thunderstorm, whereas a, a low-pressure system you can often see tracking across the southern ocean or coming down the east coast, a thunderstorm uh, usually is quite different. It's not like you can see the storms in Western Australia, they're travelling across South Australia and they make their way to Victoria. Sometimes that occurs, but Usually the life cycle of a thunderstorm is only one hour. So we've got to wait for them to develop, to see where they're developing, and then uh, issue the warning. And if we, we look at where the, the best practice of warning services for severe thunderstorms occur, and that's in the United States, they usually aim for about a 30 minute warning. If they can get that, they're pretty happy. Uh, anything uh, longer than that is uh, usually a bonus. And they've got uh, highly specialised uh, um, infrastructure in place to uh, be able to uh, analyse uh, a lot of the storms that develop in their atmospheres. And we're, we're not too far behind, but we just don't have the, um, the extensive nature of the infrastructure. But our radar network, nevertheless, is pretty good, particularly in Victoria. So in terms of thunderstorm, we get this what we call the development stage, and you would have seen this out in the, out in the land, where we see a rapid developing of a, a cloud. And then it gets to a tipping point where the, uh, what we call the updraft collapses and all that rain that was or precipitation that was suspended aloft ends up falling down to the ground. And usually that uh, is only for about 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes. It doesn't, uh, it's all over uh, in a very short time frame. And ultimately it's that outflow that you can see there on the right that ends up killing the updraft of a storm um, and it then dissipates. Uh, in fact, what you see here the, uh, that outflow from the storm can actually then be the next trigger to develop another thunderstorm. So when you see a line of storms perhaps moving across the state, each, uh, along that line usually the storms will only last an hour, but each storm may then trigger another one from developing. So it might actually look like one or more storms lasting for a long time, but in case what's happening is this redevelopment of uh, thunderstorm activity along the line. You can get severe weather from these types of storms, but usually 90% of this type of these types of storms will, won't generate severe weather in summer. Some of them will be severe, but the ones we perhaps more co we can competently uh, uh, warn for is this next type, which we call the uh, the supercell thunderstorm, uh, which is what we call which has a Different from the ones you saw before, these ones have what we call a rotating um, cloud system. And you may have seen this in the environment where the middle of the storm is actually rotating. Um, it might be masked by rain, so you might not actually see it. And it's that rotating process, just like you see the water going down the, the plug hole and the bath or the tub. Um, once you get it set up, it can often last for a long time. 
uh, sometimes the order of several hours, which is why they, they, they can be self-sustaining and uh, can, can continue to sort of generate the severe weather as they uh, cross the landscape. These are the ones that our radar system um, can pick up quite well, particularly if you're looking at the Doppler radar, um, and they're the storms that will uh, propagate uh, for uh, quite a period of time. So often when you see these storms on the radar, um, and they will last for some time, you've got a greater, with the Bureau's got a greater capacity to then warn for them. Um, just getting back to communicating this type of uh, these severe weather events, whether we're talking about fire, floods or storms, I thought I'd just show an example. This is a blast from the past. This was the, the forecast issue on Ash Wednesday. Have a little read of that. Got to love the text. ASCII. Right. This, is, this is as good as a goss. This, is the, this was the weather for the... Uh, the forecast for the day, okay? Uh, along with this, there were probably 20 town forecasts as well, and that was it. That's all that was produced. This is 5 a.m. in the morning on the day of Ash Wednesday. Particularly note the uh, comment, light winds. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the, the, the extreme fire danger just in the Mallee. I think we all know what happened that day. Um, so that's back in 1983, and that, that was the, that's the high-profile weather fog forecast product. That's when it to the media, um, through the radio. <laughs> there was no internet then, remember? So you got your weather via the radio and all the newspaper. And in fact, um, you know, the forecast the day before was, was pretty similar. It hadn't changed between the, the 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. forecast the day before and, uh, and 5 a.m. It was updated at 11 a.m. To produce to uh, to highlight extreme fire danger across the state, but it was 11 a.m. Let's contrast that to um, uh, Black Saturday. Okay, so the conditions for Black Saturday were uh, were put in, well. It was acknowledged several days in advance that the the, the weather was going to be bad. This is four days. Um, you know, look at the terminology used: absolute extreme fire weather spike day. Um, this is the sort of information now being presented at the State Control Centre to the emergency managers. Um, you, sort of, you sort of get the feeling that we've come a long way um, in 20 or so years in not only being able to forecast these bad days, but also use the terminology that galvanises the, uh, the emergency services and the community in recognising the threat at least, or preparing for the threat. Obviously, when the threat emerges, it's, uh, it's often, you know, um, uh, hang on tight. Uh, but uh, at least from a preparedness point of view, we have, we've come a long way. And similar to things like the, the flooding that occurred in Benalla, where, um, where uh, um, uh, you know, there was only mention of some rain overnight, not the intensities. We're, we're moving into the, scape net, into the landscape now of, of talking about probabilities of different outcomes. And uh, just to highlight that, this, and you may have seen this, particularly if you've been in the emergency services, we, we, this is a briefing uh, a product now that, uh, that we work with, with the SES on trying to highlight um, severe weather days uh, in advance as best we can. And also when we get to the day itself, or hopefully within 24 hours, trying to identify time frames, locations and, uh, and amounts um, from a preparedness point of view. Obviously situational awareness will we'll, we'll gazump this on the day because that's highly important, but at least from a preparedness point of view we've come a long way. That's what we use now for rainfall and a similar one for, for wind as well, just sort of highlighting those really top end wind events, how long they will last for and the types of gusts that we could potentially see. And just lastly, um, if you haven't been onto the Bureau's website for a while, there's a link to the, to the right of the satellite image to a, a new platform called METI, where you can get some very specific weather forecast information. It's used quite a lot by the fire agencies now for, for doing their plan burns and managing fires, but uh, obviously has a, um, is a great planning tool for the public and uh, for the emergency services as well, where you can get a forecast anywhere in the state. So pretty much that's all I wanted to sort of touch on as part of this presentation. 
Um, the last image there is the from the new Himawari satellite that the Japanese have launched. It's going to be a, a huge uh, bonus for Australia and for the Bureau of Meteorology and Emergency Services, providing 10-minute high-resolution satellite data from a number of different channels that will um, really keep our situational uh, awareness up to, up to date. So that's pretty much all I have, so thank you very much, and I might open it up to some questions if you have any. <coughs> Uh, the question was, how do you distinguish between just a normal uh, severe thunderstorm warning and one that is what we would call a super cell severe thunderstorm? Um, the best way is when you're seeing those severe warnings and if there's a tag on it that says this is a dangerous thunderstorm, which is a tag that's occasionally used on the product, then you know it's the latter, which is a, a supercell severe thunderstorm that could last for quite a few hours and produce damaging weather over a, a long distance. So the question was, is there much moisture in a pyrocumulus? Excellent question, and that's something that the uh, researchers have... Um, they haven't been able to nail exactly how much, but we know the atmosphere has moisture, and the process of combustion of fire releases moisture. Obviously, the, the more fuel that's consumed by the fire, the heavier the fuel, the more moisture that will be released. So that, in turn, gives it uh, a greater possibility of generating pyrocumulus. So, Crown fires are the ones that tend to generate the pyrocumulus. So the more fuel consumed means usually the more um, intense the fire behaviour will end up being. Sort of ironic, you're thinking it's unlucky moisture, but it ends up meaning you end up with a more intense <laughs> fire behaviour. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question was about tropical moisture. Um, usually in our monsoon, which is the summer months, we, we see that dip into northern Australia and uh, some weather patterns allow that moisture in the upper atmosphere to uh, basically advect, advect just means move from one location to another, advect from that part of the world to Victoria. Um, meteorologists spend a lot of time analysing the upper atmosphere and looking at where that moisture is going and sometimes it's quite dynamic, it can happen very quickly. Um, the key is you can have all that moisture coming towards Victoria, but you still need what we call a trigger to, um, to squeeze it. How long have we got? Nothing. That's it? <laughs> I gave you five minute warning, yep. but you just waved back at me. Today. Oh, no, no. no. I, uh, I, saw, I saw the five minute warning and uh, the wave was the acknowledgement. Uh, so uh, we'll finish there now. Um, I'll, I'll hang around uh, for, uh, for 10, 10 minutes or so if anyone's got any further questions. But uh, yeah, have a great end of the day.